fact, we have uh, Nadine actually in the uh, GoTo webinar yet. Uh, we'll have a quick look at the list. Uh, Nadine, are, uh, are you with us? I am with you. I am lurking in the background. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. Hi, you. Good to see you. <laughs> Virtual hug. <laughs> thank you so much for being with us today. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. This hey, Nadine, so you just wrote a book, didn't you? Just wrote two. Two books. Two two books. What, was, was one not enough? <laughs> uh, the one was more of a passion project. The second was a lot harder than uh, the first one. So, yeah, yeah. The, the first one was pleasurable to write. So we, we have a few minutes here. So uh, I can read your bio. I can certainly do that. Um, okay. so, so Nadine has been in the technology in industry for over 17 years in a variety of positions from marketing to training to web development to hardware. She's worked in academia as an IT director of a private elementary middle school. Boy, but that was a tough job. And <laughs> as a technology instructor of postgraduate classes at the university level, uh, Nadine has trained in the corporate world for Fortune 50 companies, as well as gotten her hands on experience working for the Department of Defense with a focus on advanced cybersecurity. And uh, like so many of us, Nadine says in her bio that she loves what she does. And I think a lot of us can relate to that. So we appreciate you being here. Hey, look, we have a John Strand sighting on screen as well. John, we cannot hear you. I was excited to come and see this presentation. Oh, too cool. Uh, anything that deals with imposter syndrome and kind of the way pen testers view themselves and how we deal with it is I'm, I'm right there. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It, it really surprised me when I was hunting for a topic. I, I started asking around and then I started asking some of my favorite people and it was like, no way. Kind of like you, John, I, you're on a pedestal in my world. So it's just like, no. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it landed, I, I think, appropriately for timing and everything. No, it's perfect. Especially since I think right now our entire industry is, especially on the offensive security side of things, I think that, that, that we're definitely due for a change or an evolution. So I think now is the best time to be having these types of conversations. Because we, I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I don't think that we spent a lot of time thinking about what we wanted to be, how we are. And I think that we're at a point now where we can actually have the conversation of what do we want to be in the offensive community moving forward in the next 10 years. Yeah, I think a lot of us are just heads down. And, and, you know, we occasionally come up for air and then we go back to heads down. So I think the conversation is vital. Yeah. Because I don't want I don't want the, the offensive testers of the next few years to be the people that uh, have to go through the same type of weird crap that we did to get here. <laughs> we can do better. Yeah, but it made us who we are. That's right. It made us the weird people that we are. No. <laughs> my totally digging, I, I, I've got to say this out loud, Nadine. I am totally digging your T-shirt. That is so yeah. awesome. <laughs> I wore this for you. Yeah, this was one of my favorites. I, I know when I'm when I'm around people that you know are my tribe because they'll go, I get it. They'll they'll nod. They'll point. They'll wave. <laughs> I guess we'll jump off the screen, Nadine, and uh, let you uh, take it away. All right. So I remember uh, watching Jerry Seinfeld do a setup, do a, do a, a stand-up set a while back, and he said there was a survey that stated the average person's greatest fear is having to give a speech in public, and somehow this is ranked even higher than death which is like third on the list. And so it made me laugh. It made me think, you're telling me that the next time you're at a funeral, most people would rather be the guy in the coffin than having to stand up and give a eulogy. And so it made me think, why are most people so afraid of being judged by others? So, you know, rather than dealing with the Grim Reaper. So that was kind of the basis of this talk. John might recognize that. <laughs> So what a tribe that we have, and kudos to all the speakers who have come before me. I loved Doc Bradburn's talk and, you know, Dave, Kennedy, and John. Everybody who has presented makes this look so easy. And uh, by the way, John, I want to see this talk next year. How to make presenting at cyber conferences not suck. This year has been fabulous. 
So again, my talk is The Secret Thoughts of a Successful Hacker, Exploring Imposter Syndrome and Pluralistic Ignorance. And I would say that's something I've probably been dealing with for at least, oh, the last 20 years when I started in IT, and I still kind of struggle with it today. I was flying home a couple years ago from Atlanta to Denver, and um, I'd been upgraded to first class. And I know, I know, I know some of you absolutely hate flying or you're like my husband and you hate talking to strangers on a flight. But my modus operandi is to smile and I'll nod and I'll say hello. And if my seatmate says hello back, then, you know, we'll have a conversation. Otherwise, I'll put on my noise canceling headphones and I'll watch a movie or read or write or whatever. But on this flight, seatmate actually smiled back. And um, we had a conversation and it turns out he was an application developer and that piqued my interest. And I started asking all sorts of kind of questions. Turns out he was flying to Denver to um, meet with a venture capitalist to show them the final product. And of course, I'm a geek, terribly interested and uh, asked all sorts of questions. And most of the questions I asked, he said, that's proprietary. I can't share that. Uh, but he, what he could share with me was that he could take a picture of the back of any car and list it for sale. And so towards the end of the flight, he finally asked me what I did. And I told him I worked for Rapid7. I was a consultant. I taught security classes, mostly vulnerability management and Metasploit. But occasionally I would dabble with SAST and DAST testing. And, and I loved playing with App Spider. And he said, what's that? And I thought, oh. Oh, imposter. But that is the mindset of some of the developers that I've met. They're brilliant and creative and full of wonderful ideas. And they have this vast knowledge of coding. But when it comes to security, mm -mm, not so much. And I thought I'm never downloading that app. And I'm kind of like when I go to a cybersecurity conference, I take the flip phone. I have looked for that app in uh, app stores and I guess he didn't get the funding. I haven't seen it. But um, yeah, I internalized that conversation and it really got me thinking. And yes, that is my dream car. It's a 1967 Shelby GT500. No, that's not my password. You will have to put an exclamation point at the end. <laughs> I am blessed. I do have two little ones. They're not quite this little anymore. My daughter is very artistic. She is a painter. She is a singer. My son is the thinker, and he is much more the questioner, and he always wants to know who's going to win. And so at the dinner table, sometimes we'll have this debate. So a couple of weeks back, this was the debate. Who would win? Godzilla or King Kong? So the Discord server is up, and if you guys want to debate and chat, go for it. We can multitask. And so it's really interesting to hear that tactical conversation coming out of my, you know, 11 year old's mouth. And so we had another discussion. And we had another debate. Who would win? Well, I've got to go with Jean Grey. You know, if I was in the Marvel Universe, yeah, I would probably go Scarlet Witch. But Jean Grey is going to win, hands down. And so that was a fun debate at the, the dinner table. And this is one we had last week. Who would win? I'm the one on the right, <laughs> by the way. So if my son, if you tell him to do something, he wants to know why. And when he hears a new word, he wants to know what it means. They're both in virtual school. And sometimes I can hear him online asking questions. And I'm thinking, oh, crap, <laughs> what is he going to ask now? It's going to be a doozy of a question. When he prefaces the question with, can I ask you something? It means that he's already put some thought into it and he's probably already thought of an argument for what he thinks your answer is going to be. And I think he's going to be a wonderful social engineer one day. So Chris had Nagy, watch out. I think my 12 year old's going to come for you. I don't know where we were or uh, where we were going, but he was in the back seat of the car and he asked, Mama, can I ask you a question? And again, oh crap. If smart people know they're smart, do dumb people know they're dumb? 
And after that, you know, initial surprise and laughter, as usual, I try to turn those questions around. You know, I want them to figure out the answer. You know, that Socratic method of parenting where actually the answer is, I don't know how to answer that. So I started asking him questions. I said, Gavin, do smart people really know they're smart? What makes a smart person smart? Do you think you're smart? Do you think I'm smart? That was a loaded question. And so believe it or not, many smart people don't think they are. And so that opened, opened up that conversation that we're having today. Smart people know there is so much more to know. You learn something new and it opens up a new world and then another and then another. So there is this interesting phenomenon called imposter syndrome and a really quite a few really smart overachieving successful hackers suffer from this i know i've been asking around for the past couple of months if you've never heard of this it is a concept describing an individual who is marked by an inability to internalize their accomplishments and a persistent fear of being exposed as a fraud there are significant psychological patterns in which an individual starts to doubt their talent and at any moment you feel like you're about to be found out. Have you ever internalized any of these questions? What if they find out I'm not as smart as I think I am? I can't pull this off. Who am I kidding? That exploit will never work. Lucky me. I was at the right place at the right time. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. And honestly, that one's mine, most definitely. If anybody, if I can do it, anybody can do it. And that's not coming from a place of arrogance. It is a genuine feeling that if I can do it, anybody can do it. When John and Velda asked me to speak, honestly, my gut reaction was, Whiskey, tango, foxtrot, no, no. What on earth would I say to a Wild West Hacking Fest audience? I've been in that audience, but I've been a huge fan of John's for years, and Velda is very tenacious, so <laughs> here I am. So this is what I want to talk about today, what it is, who has it, when does it happen, how to get help, and how to get rid of it. So this is an interesting chart. According to the International Journal of Behavioral Science, studies suggest that more than 70% of people experience the imposter syndrome. It's a phenomenon at some point in their career, no matter what field they're in. I've talked to people in, in medicine. I've talked to people in academia. I've talked to people in cyber. I even talked to an attorney friend of mine, and she's got more degrees than anybody I know. 89% of people say imposter syndrome is going to affect their performance. So the next time you're in a room with, oh, 100 people, two, never feel this level of anxiety. And so some of the common symptoms of imposter syndrome would be things like extreme lack of self-confidence, feelings of inadequacy, Constantly comparing yourself to others, I do that. Self-doubt and distrust in your intuition and your capabilities. Albert Einstein, he is recognized as one of the most influential scientists of what, the last 500 years? He had a case of imposter syndrome. He once said to a close friend, and I'm quoting, the exaggerated esteem in which my life work is held makes me very ill at ease. I feel compelled to think of myself as an involuntary swindler. Einstein. Nobody thinks of Einstein as a fraud, yet he felt insecure about many of his talents and achievements, as do a lot of us. The civil rights activist, author, poet, Nobel laureate, Maya Angelou, I got to meet her in high school. She admitted at times she often felt like a fraud. She said once, I have written 11 books, but each time I think, uh-oh, they're going to find me out now. I've run a game on everybody. 
and they're going to find me out. Hermione Granger, <laughs> the Harry Potter actress, Emma Watson, also publicly admitted she has a problem. She falls into the trap of imposter syndrome. In an interview with Vogue, she shared how she feels when people come up and offer her praise for her acting. She said, when I receive recognition for my acting, I feel so uncomfortable. I feel like a imposter. Now, we can't forget one of my favorite actors. Yes, in Deadpool, not Green Lantern. <laughs> Ryan Reynolds actually suffers from imposter syndrome. He is said, to be honest, I feel like a freckled faced kid faking it until I make it. Deadpool has imposter syndrome. This is Dr. Margaret Chan. Forbes once said that she was the 30th, 30th most powerful woman in the world. She served ter two terms at uh, WHO, the World Health Organization. And wouldn't you think somebody with that type of credentials, that kind of educational background, decades of medical experience, she'd feel like an expert. No, nope. this is a direct quote. There are an awful lot of people out there who think I'm an expert. How do these people believe that about me? I am so aware of all the things I don't know. And that, my friends, I think that's the key. That is the key to imposter syndrome. It's really quite normal. It is arrogant of any of us to think that we know it all. There are very few hackers that I know that think they do. Good ones realize that there's so much more to know. You open up a door or a back door, uh -huh. <laughs> and there's so much world left to explore and to learn from. I was on LinkedIn the other day, and a friend of mine popped up out of nowhere. Imposter syndrome. When you work in tech, everyone has it. Nobody talks about it. You're supposed to be the smartest person in the room. You're the software engineer genius, and you should know it all, right? Here's the truth. We were all imposters at some point. No matter how skilled or expert you are today, you were once a noob, too. So stop pretending you know it all. Raise your hand. Ask the question. Embrace the fact that tech is a constant flux of learning. Caleb is a director at a company that you know, and I think it's a very powerful quote. So imposters, all the imposters that exist, don't necessarily look at failure the same way. They don't look at competence the same way. Sometimes you have a perfectionist, and their primary focus is on how something is done. You might know this person. You might be this person. Because you expect to know everything, even a minor lack of knowledge denotes failure or shame. And then you might have the soloist. The soloist cares mostly about the who. Who completes the task to make it on the achievement list? It has to be you and you alone because you need to think and figure everything out on your own. If you need help, it's a sign of failure. This is one of my favorite quotes. Bonus points if you know who said it. There is no limit to the amount of good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit. So I think there's a couple others. Multitasking, you've got the expert. I have friends who measure their competence based on the how many roles they can juggle and excel in. And if you fall short, whether you're a parent, partner, at work, a host, a friend, a volunteer, if you don't do it all easily and if you don't do it perfectly, Sometimes you get that feeling of shame, and you shouldn't. I love Calvin and Hobbes. I have the complete set, or at least I had the complete set until Gavin stole it, and it's upstairs in his room. At some point or another in our careers, pretty much all of us experience self-doubt. It doesn't matter how smart or how awesome there have been times in my life I've not felt good enough. I felt like an imposter and it comes in waves and it washes over you no matter what I do, no matter what I study or how hard I study. 
I'm not going to be good enough. And I look around and see people who are smarter, richer, funnier, kinder, stronger, prettier, more dedicated. You see those who drive DeLoreans, <laughs> but not many of you type faster than I do. So a little bit about me. Who am I? I have worked in over 20 years. Yeah, I need to update that intro. I've been help desk and I've been an IT director. I taught certification classes at the Pentagon. I was escorted to the bathroom by a man with a very large gun and he did not smile. I've taught a couple of times for uh, Fortune 50 companies at the World Trade Center. NYPD actually asked me to come back. I taught a couple of cybersecurity classes for them. And I currently hold about maybe about 30 industry certifications. And I know some of you poop on those, but um, they come in handy. There was one time my CIO was having a problem with a DOD customer and I had clearance. But um, he told me to add every single certification to my signature block, and it became a very big signature block. I've taught cybersecurity for RSA and EMC. Probably my favorite gig is teaching Metasploit when I was at Rapid7. It was an absolute joy to watch somebody drop a interpreter shell for the first time. I worked at Puppet for a little while, and you know that's not the easiest software in the world but it's definitely the most scalable. And now I am actually the uh, manager of consulting and education services at FireEye. I'm a Jane of all trades. I do it all, a little bit of it all. I'm not a master of anything. And I'm very proud to say my cybersecurity uh, blue team toolkit has a 4.6 rating on Amazon. The other one is a uh, practice test study guide for one of the more technical uh, certifications I hold. And honestly, there's nothing Nothing like walking into Barnes and Noble, pulling your book off the shelf, signing it, putting it back. But out of all of those five star ratings, I still focus on the one one star rating I got from John Carroll in the UK. I do. So my current project, um, I'm working with Cybex as a technical editor of the Security Plus. 601 book by Mike Chappell and Di David Seidel. And I feel like this lifeguard. <laughs> Seriously, I've got one chapter to go. And the biggest mistake I found so far was uh, there was a question that was misnumbered. And then there was a URL that 404 talk about imposter syndrome. So I did stress about this topic. And my husband told me, talk about something you're passionate about. And most of the time, what I'm passionate about is what I've learned. So I've learned I am my biggest critic. And I've also learned I don't take criticism from people I wouldn't take advice from. I've learned that this industry moves very fast and it's hard to keep up. And it helps to have dear friends in the industry who will technically edit your book and still respect you in the morning. <laughs> Isn't it ironic that the feelings of imposter syndrome those feelings of self-doubt self can be particularly high for, self, for high achievers. And I would bet those of you who are taking time out of your busy schedule to attend this conference, and on top of that, this is a non-techie talk. You're in that club. I spoke to people that I hold in high esteem, and then I talked to some people in upper management. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, a, CI, a CISO friend of mine who said he would be here, Ian, if you are here, I owe you a pint the next time I'm in London. He said that CISOs that he knows are sometimes worried that someone's going to find him out. I have an author friend, and, and her book is probably on your shelf last year at, at uh, Black Hat. She was afraid nobody was going to sign up, come up to uh, get her book signed. It was crazy. The line was wrapped around the booth. Same Black Hat. I'm, I'm coming down the elevator in Mandalay Bay, and... There was one other guy on the elevator, smile, modus operandi, hi. And uh, we had a great conversation. We talked about his favorite beer and my favorite martini and, and about books. And he was headed to his book signing. And I had told him where I'd had my book signing. And he had no idea where he was supposed to go. He said, it won't take too long. Nobody's going to be there. What party are you going to later? And so we ended up hiking, you know, Black Hat at Mandalay Bay to the ballroom. It's quite a hike. 
And when we got to the ballroom, I stood in line and then realized, crap, that was his book. And so I'd had a captive audience for a good 15, 20 minutes with, you know, Death Veggie himself, Luke Benfrey. He signed my book for the woman in the elevator. How do I get your book? And so I swear sometimes I, I feel like I should rip this out and frame it. Some humility can be a good thing. And it really guards against getting that big head in the same way self-doubt can be paralyzing. So if you leave now, and, and I think about eight of you have, <laughs> one of the biggest things I want you to take away from this, you are not alone. So many people feel the same way. Remind yourself of all the great things you've done, what you've accomplished. You just don't look good on paper. These are actual accomplishments that you've earned. So, pluralistic ignorance. What is it? So, pluralistic ignorance happens when people erroneously infer that they feel differently than their peers, even though they're behaving the same way. So, imagine the following. You're sitting in a large lecture hall and you're listening to a complicated lecture on malware analysis. And I've sat that class. If you ever get a chance to watch Lenny Zeltzer rip apart malware, I highly recommend it. It is poetry in motion. So anyway, you're sitting there. You've started to get lost somewhere maybe or after disassembling the binary file. And Lenny pauses. And he asks, are there any questions? And not a single hand goes up. You're lost. But your fear of looking dumb has kept you from raising your hand. You look around the room. Nobody else is raising their hand. But you interpret that these other students understand everything that's going on. They genuinely have no questions. And so you've got these assumptions you make about the cause of your behavior. And then the cause of your classmates' behavior, that is pluralistic ignorance. And so for those of us who sometimes experience pluralistic ignorance, you see yourself as less knowledgeable, more uptight, less committed, less competent than your fellow hackers, and it leaves you feeling bad about yourself. And that leaves you alienated from the group or the institution that you belong, our tribe of hackers. I hope Marcus is here. Anyway, see what I did there? Pluralistic ignorance can be dispelled and the negative consequences alleviated and through my passion, education. But what if you're experiencing imposter syndrome and pluralistic ignorance? That's kind of scary. Not only do you feel like a fraud in your own right, but everyone else is smarter, better, faster than you. And that is a double whammy. So speaking of education, imposter syndrome, pluralistic ignorance, I really like this chart. These are the four stages of confidence, and they came out in the 70s. And I love this model because it applies to just about everything. If you're in medicine or you're in sports or or philosophy, cybersecurity, hacking, the very first stage is unconscious incompetence. You don't know why you're bad at hacking. You're ignorant. And you look at the little blinky light and, and you're not sure if it's good or bad. But after you've had a mentor for a little while or you've watched a couple of uh, LinkedIn learnings, you start to be self-conscious. You start to be aware of your own skill level. In other words, you start to know why you suck. And then you have to practice. A lot of us have to practice a lot. And so you have more classes and you've got mentorship and you start moving into this conscious confidence. And now you're starting to realize mm, you're a pretty good hacker. Not only that, you know why you're good and you knew the journey that you had to take to get there. So more practice and experimenting with your own style, you finally reach that unconscious confidence. In other words, Hacking does become second nature to you, or at least a, a core set of skills do. 
it's the way you write an exploit or the way you social engineer the receptionist to let you into the comm closet. These things are now pretty natural and you don't have to think about them. That last stage, though, there is a danger because you get complacent. And, and sometimes since the things are so natural, you don't push your, yourself anymore. You, you don't read as much as you do. These stages kind of give us this window into our own learning experience. And it's profound to think of this as a model for thinking about any new thing that you're learning. I do have a personal opinion about expertise. You will never see me put expert after my name, ever. I, I've seen some people do it on LinkedIn. But my grandma used to say, being rich is like being a lady. If you have to tell people you are, you're not. We know who the experts are. We've seen them present at this conference. I feel the same way about expertise. When I was first approached uh, to write my first book, my editor approached me and he actually wanted me to write a book on Metasploit. And no, <laughs> I work at Rapid7. HD was the chief research officer. I got to sit at the table a couple of times with James Lee, Egypt, if you're here. Sam Huckins, so now you know where Shuckins come from. Brent Cook, talk about imposter syndrome. No, I'm not writing that book. I have that book on my shelf. David did it. It's right behind me. But then they came back and they said, propose what I would want to write about. So I wrote the book that I needed 20 years ago when I was the noob. So how do you best manage your own self-doubt? We know that success is a matter of repetition. You didn't know you were getting homework. <laughs> well, you're getting some. Our brain shapes itself based on repetitive thoughts, repetitive behaviors. Words play a key role in how we convey our thoughts to ourselves as well as the rest of the world. And we're our, we, we are a result of that repetition. Just as much as we are our mental and physical patterns, you exercise, you get healthy. You, you don't use the, the wrong words, you get mentally healthy. And, and we think about ourselves in words, don't we? And I know that there are social engineers in here. The words that you use when I'm social engineering tells me a lot. Who you are, your state of mind, your character, your direction in life. Just by paying attention to what you say, I get an idea of how you feel about yourself. I start understanding who you are. And so the words you think and the words you speak have a direct correlation to how you think about yourself. I want you to pay a great deal of attention to both the thoughts you have and the words you say. I was at the um, EC Council uh, hacker halted in Atlanta a couple of years ago. That might have been the same flight that they upgraded me on. But anyway, I had to go. Daryl Highland was presenting from Rapid7. Chris Roberts came and, you know, you have to go get some whiskey with him. But Deidre Diamond of Cyber SN out of Boston was one of the keynote speakers. And I love Deidre. She gave us a couple of words to remove from our vocabulary. And I'm going to add a couple. So grab a pen. I want you to write these down and never say them again. The first one is obviously. There is absolutely no way, because I have tried, there's no way to say obviously and not sound like a jerk. It's so condescending, especially if you keep your teeth together. Obviously. Try it. Oh, wait. Obviously, you, I, them, they're not good enough. Don't use that word anymore. The second word I want you to remove is but. Yeah, but. Okay, but stop it. When you use this word with other people, it means you're everything but okay. With someone else's point of view, maybe you don't think it's valuable or you haven't paid attention. You were listening to reply, not to understand. And how often do you butt yourself? I wish I could, but you will have so much better conversations with yourself and others 
if you add something rather than remove it. The next time you're engaged in any type of exchange, I want you to replace but with and. Watch what happens. I wish I could, but becomes, I wish I could, and. See the feeling? See how it changes? You're not an imposter, and is going to open up that new world. Never. Now, you know the adage, never say never, because the minute you say never, <laughs> it's going to happen. I've never run out of gas. Ha! Uh, Literally, never say never. It reduces trust. It reduces energy and your motivation. Replace never with possible. And I also want you to remove impossible. This one is probably the most common one. Whether you think it or whether you say it, you're pointing out how something can't be done rather than figuring out how to make it happen. Impossible is going to harm you. Impossible is going to harm you, your organization, your relationships, and ultimately your life. It indulging in its use, it never brings you peace of mind. No matter what you do, you will be a better person. You'll be a better hacker when you remove impossible from your vernacular. Erase it from your vocabulary and tell yourself, you got this. So the last word that I want you to remove is try. Well, <laughs> because Yoda said so. We all love Yoda. Do or do not. There is no try. Don't ever try to do something. Just don't try. You either do something or you don't. You commit or you surrender. There's no in between. Trying means you're giving way too much space to the possibility of failure because maybe your thoughts are centered around the fact that nothing might, you know, really work out in the end. And guess what you start feeling like? An imposter. You feel stuck and it starts waving over you again. So these are your curse words. I want you to grab a jar. And the next time you think it or say it, I want you to put a quarter or a dollar in that jar. And after a year, take a trip to Hawaii, because I promise you, they're in your vocabulary more than you think they are. So we worked on the vocabulary. We've got this mindset. Now we're planning a vacation. But self-doubt can really manifest itself many different ways. I had a boss. Uh, and uh, they gave me a script to read for this five-minute update to sales. It was my project. The script even had jokes in it. And I really respected this boss up until about this point. And I started to doubt myself. I thought, I've been a college professor. I'm a published author. Am I too technical? Am I not technical enough? Am I too verbose? Am I saying something wrong? You might dread an upcoming meeting or gig convinced you're not going to pull this off. You get the feeling that your comments, have you ever told a joke and you just felt it went good? You walk out of a meeting or even a job interview convinced that you, there, there were 10 better answers that you could have given. If anybody knows Jimmy Alley from uh, Lost Rabbit, he says, we need constant sanity checks from each other. Many high achievers that I know have this perfectionist streak. And it can make them hate to act without that 100% certainty, especially in new, uh, new situations where they think that they're more likely to miss a step and then you hold back rather than jumping in and learning from the situation. Or have you ever stayed too long in a situation that's toxic? Do you ever overthink things as you search for that perfect answer and then the moment's gone? And so many times these high achievers, which are all of us, operate as if every single interaction is high stakes, when in reality, we should take small risks. It could have a huge upside. So look for examples in your own tribe of individuals. Take stretch assignments, a task that's beyond your current knowledge or skill set, 
something that requires you to stretch developmentally, you know, the stretch assignment is a challenge, puts you into that uncomfortable situation. You're thinking outside the box. That's going to help you learn and grow. This for me, this isn't a technical talk. This is a stretch. So I want you to be the person that steps in at the last minute to cover for a colleague or you might prove adept or learn that you really like this new skill that you that you develop. And, and these opportunities not only shows you, but it shows leaders that you can be fearless. And in reality, many people that you think are fearless are just acting anyway. Hold yourself to a higher standard. And as a result, you know, if you didn't pursue that bigger opportunity, you could get left behind. And even in those roles that you would have been amazing. So remember, it's not, it's okay not to know everything. And after a big life event, like going back to school or earning a promotion, there is a steep learning curve. And rather than hiding, think of yourself as an amateur. Honestly, as long as you're enthusiastic, most people are going to cut you some slack. So I love this picture. Actually, before Dr. Josh came, John and I were together. <laughs> think of the people you consider to be a mentor. Become like them. Teach, lecture, volunteer. And next year, you should present what you're most passionate about at a conference. And I promise you, you'll be surprised how much you know. You'll get rid of that imposter syndrome. As we become experts in a field <clears throat> or rise to that top of the class, we realize that we still have a lot to learn. And that amplifies that sense of fraudulence that you have. It's only when you're able to really compare yourself to the newbies that you start getting a perspective on your own success. Remind yourself how far you've come by helping the generation that's coming up behind you. I was in the junior league for a, a little over a decade. And, and for those of you who don't know what the junior league is, it's an organization of women who are committed to volunteerism. And uh, I was able to go to a national conference once as a VP and the president was giving a speech and it really stuck with me. Her quote was, we are planting the oak trees that we'll never sit in the shade of. And that's what we're doing. We are, we, we've got people coming up behind us. So again, remember, it's, it's okay not to know everything. It's okay not to be perfect. And honestly, maybe if you carry around just a little bit of imposter syndrome, it's okay. That authentic modesty is going to keep you real. So, yeah, I love this picture. I actually printed it out and it's on my bulletin board. And whenever I feel those waves coming, it's like I presented at the Wild West Hacking Fest. So there you have it. I told you there would be a little bit of homework. I want you to remove those words, get rid of them, those toxic words from your vocabulary. You'll be surprised how much you are, you, even if it's just mentally that you think of them. Let go of being a perfectionist. Be ready to take a little bit of a risk. Stretch. Track your success. It's for reals. And lastly, one of the things that I think is probably the most important is have a mentor. And if you don't have one, be one. So, another self identifying imposter, Tina Fey. She says everyone else is an imposter too. You're not alone. So I'll see you guys at the bottom of the shoot. All right. Thanks so much, Nadine. I loved your talk. I can't say how much I loved your talk. And I bet you a lot of people in the industry that are listening to us right now loved that talk as well. It's one of those that that goes along with a, a, a actually a series of talks we've had uh, revolving around mental health, and and it really speaks to that. You, you're not alone, folks. Everybody goes through these things. Well, there's been a lot of uh, visceral reaction because I had to scroll down quite a bit. Um, <laughs> I closed. So any actually. <laughs> kept looking over and it's like, no, I've got to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Anybody got any quick questions for uh, Nadine? Uh, aside from uh, just, just showing a, a lot of admiration, which is uh, there's lots of love hearts coming up. Great talk. Well done. 
the old Jeff Jeff McJunk in there. Uh, well, thank you. I do find sometimes when I'm nervous, I talk faster than I usually do. I try to stop and think, you know, I was born and raised in, in Louisiana and New Orleans, so the accent can come out sometimes. So I try to slow down and talk a little slower, but then <laughs> <laughs> to a technical group, I don't want to talk too slow. Is, is that actually truly drawing from your roots, uh, Nadine? I mean, in, in every sense of the word. So uh, that's funny. I, I can have a, a hurricane down on, you know, next to Preservation Hall and and go to Pato's and it, it's back in a heartbeat. <laughs> we see, yeah, one of the, one of the trends that I've, I've really liked at Wild West Hacking Fest uh, this year is, is a lot of us are acknowledging the, the level of effort and the level of stress and the level of perfectionism and, and obsession that, you know, that we all sort of go through in this, in this industry. And I think there's a realization. Um, I, and, I, and part of it, I think is because of the maturity of the industry that, that, you can't hold it all up yourself, you know, <laughs> just slow down a little bit, get what, get your part, what you're really good at and do that right. And and then move on to the next thing. And your talk reminded me of exactly that, you know, make sure you're, uh, you're remembering to be human and uh, don't be too hard on yourself. There's so many good things. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And thank you, Velda. You, you pushed me. And, and, um, <laughs> I really glad I thought about you. saying you know what? But you're right. You're right. I, I did. I do suffer sometimes suffer from that perfectionism. You know, the 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 dishes are in the dishwasher when I go to bed. Um, you, you can tell by my bookshelf that one section is IT, one section is nonfiction, one section is fiction. Uh, if you open up my closet, my clothes closet, it's short sleeves, long sleeves, skirts, dresses, and they're color graduated. I tried really hard with this not to become that perfectionist. Um, last night, shout out to Tiffany if you're here. I had a dear friend sit with me and I ran through it once and it was like, okay, I got it. I got it. I'm just going to let it roll. And uh, so I only practiced it once you know, in front of somebody. But yeah, I know people that would hammer it until they they had it. And And who has time for that? So. Well, yeah, that's so, so true. Hey, hey, there's a um, there is actually a great comment slash question here in Discord. I think that was directed at me, but I'll go ahead and uh, and throw it open to to all of us. So, Kamikaze says, as somebody new to the industry, how do you find, or in my case, he's directing it at me. How did you find what you love and wanted to be really good at? It's something I'm trying to find for myself. I, you know, I I want to throw that open. To you, Nadine, how would you respond to that question? Experiment. Uh, my first gig, I thought I wanted, if we go back far enough, I wanted to go to law school. I was a poli sci major and uh, I wanted to get a law degree. I wanted to run for office. I wanted to change the world. I wanted to make it a better place and had a horrific experience <laughs> during a campaign and it changed my life. Bob Livingston was a speaker of the house at the time, and we were at a fundraiser, and he put his arm around me, and he said, Nadine, you'd make the best politician's wife. And I was oh, like, God. <laughs> hey, what's going to get me out of LSU fastest? So yeah. I got a degree in business, and um, I actually put myself through school dealing. So I actually, I'm fun at Black Hat, so find me at Black Hat. Uh, I've dealt craps, blackjack, baccarat, poker. I know the odds. And so after that, it, it just ended up being, I think I can do that. I had worked in the marketing department at the casino and um, the CEO walked by and I was building an access database because up until then, everything was on paper. And I was like, oh, heck no, I've got a $1.3 million budget. I'm not putting that on paper. So <laughs> he walked by and he said, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm building a database. He goes, you know how to do that? And I was like, yeah. He goes, would you teach us how? And that's where it started. It was just kind of an accident. So I started teaching operating systems. I started teaching HTML. I started teaching. Uh, and then I walked into the Gateway store. Do you remember the Gateway stores that used to be? I remember. Uh, yeah. Cows? Those were uh, awesome. I walked into the store and somebody that I'd gone to Sunday school with as a little kid 
was sitting at the desk. He was the assistant manager. And it was like, Craig, what are you doing? And he goes, what are you doing? And I said, I'm teaching. What are you teaching? And I had a job offer by the end of the day. And it just rolled from there. It was a, a series of opportunities. It's a series of sometimes I get in trouble because I'll teach a class and then somebody in my class tries to hire me <laughs> to, to come to their company or teach something or do something. I, I'm sure all of you have gotten that. And so really long job interviews, like if you're teaching, I, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love teaching. It's my niche. And, and my biggest opportunity came. I left. I was working for the DOD. We were standing up Air Force Global Strike Command at Barksdale Air Force Base, and uh, I moved to Fort Carson. Uh, it was a huge move. I'd never lived outside of Louisiana. And I moved. Ryan Hendricks gave me the opportunity to teach. So it was really a certification, A+, plus, Net+, plus, Security+. Plus. Again, I didn't want to teach it if I couldn't pass the test. And I taught there for a couple of years, and, and then it was like, I've been furloughed a couple of times. It's like, okay, let's go get a real job. And it's just been a series of, you know, that looks interesting. I think I can do that. And I'm absolutely positively thrilled to have landed at FireEye. Uh, threat intelligence has always been super duper cool to me. Looking at IR, and uh, I, I feel like now I get to use all of that skill set I, I developed while I was figuring out what I wanted to do. So, so now not only do I get to still be in education, but I get to be in cybersecurity education and cutting edge cybersecurity education. So don't oh, say down. It's kind of like my book. I really did say no. And I'm so glad that they came back and I actually did it because it's opened doors and, and uh, again, book signings. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it, wow. it's for the newbie. It, it's for the, the new person, which is, again, John Carroll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd go kick his chair if I could, but um, yeah. <laughs> well, that was a that was a, a great, great answer. There was something that I really related to in your talk that I wanted to share with you, and that was the uh, and I'm going to paraphrase here. I don't remember your exact words, but uh, one of the problems or, or challenges that I've had in in in, in my past uh, career life is it totally related to how damaged I was uh, growing up which was trying to save the world, right? That this, this sort of, I've got to hold it together. Maybe I'm not doing it right. And I didn't know when to cut and run. And it took me a long time to come to terms with that. You know, when is the time to say, look, you're, you know, to, to self-reflect and obviously say, you're not happy with this. You need to look elsewhere. You need to actually cut bait and run. It's a very, very tough thing to have that insecurity of potentially being unemployed or, or you know, in transition, or whatever you want to call it, and and that was a very big mountain for me to climb. But once I climbed that mountain, and I realized that there were other places that would value me, that really opened my eyes. And you know, I, I guess I'm partially responding to the question that was asked: How do you find the thing you love? What I actually did was I sought out people, primarily that 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 were my tribe, were my folks that I knew that would give me the space to learn and to grow and i had to get to a certain maturity level before i could seek that out um so that's my answer to your question kamikaze on uh, on discord yeah uh, and to build on that i think that you know like you growing up I, I i never cut bait i was taught as a young child you know we don't quit and once you've felt that value and you know your worth the next time you're in a situation where you're not valued, you'll recognize it. You might not see it in the very, very beginning, but eventually you'll feel it and then you'll know that this was a great opportunity. I've learned a lot, but this is not a good fit. That This is not for me. And then you start exploring. And and I, I it's worked out for me. So I, I am incredibly blessed to be where I am. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I feel very much the same way. I, I do remember having a thought, and I'm going to totally make John's head grow here for a moment. But I was sitting in a SANS class many, many years ago, and John came in and, and he was talking with one of the instructors, and he probably doesn't remember this. I was sitting in the front row and watching him, and I actually had a moment where I said to myself, I'm going to work with you one day somehow. 
And here we are in 2020. And that was a now a good 10 years ago, if not more. But I am working with John. And uh, that is you know, too- intent uh, and intention mean something. Your words, your actions will follow. Uh, so it's it's really fantastic.